Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. Today, I want to start taking a closer look at what happens in gases at the molecular level. There are two related things that we might like to know about the molecules in a sample of gas. How quickly are they moving, and what's their kinetic energy? Those two properties will help us understand how gases behave, and today we'll come up with useful and simple equations for both the velocity and the kinetic energy. But we'll have to do a little work to get there. To begin, let's think about what pressure really means. Back in video 7, we imagined a rectangular box with a gas in it. The molecules of gas collide with the walls of the container, and that's the source of the pressure. So, pressure is just the result of the force exerted by the collisions. In addition, the size of the container is important. If we shrink the box, but keep the number of molecules inside the same, those collisions will happen more often, so the pressure will increase. So, the pressure is proportional to the force, and inversely proportional to the inner surface area of the container. Let's see what else we can learn from this expression. As you probably know, Newton's second law of motion tells us that the force exerted by a particle is equal to its mass times its acceleration. In addition, the acceleration is the change in the velocity with time, so we can rewrite this force equation this way. Let's think more deeply about this equation. Suppose we focus on just one molecule in the gas, and let's only worry about its motion in the x direction. The particle probably is moving in the x, y, and z directions, but for now, we'll just focus on how much it's moving in the x direction. We'll call its velocity in the x direction vx. The formula for momentum is mass times velocity, so mvx is the momentum in the x direction. So, our particle travels across the box with this momentum. When it eventually hits the wall of the box, it bounces off in an elastic collision, which means it's now traveling with the same speed, but in the opposite direction. That means that the change in the momentum is 2 times mvx. Now, as you might expect, the pressure exerted by a gas depends on how often the particles hit the walls of the container. So, how long does it take for a particle to hit the wall, then travel the distance across the box and back again so that it hits the wall a second time. To find out, we can use the general formula for the velocity of a particle. The velocity is the distance traveled over time. And what's the distance traveled? Well, suppose the length of the box along the x-axis is called a. In that case, a molecule that hits the back wall will have to travel all the way across the box and back again before it hits the wall again. That's a distance of 2 times a. Now that we know that, we can use it for the distance in our velocity equation, then solve the equation for time, which gives us this. So, the time between collisions of a particle with this back wall is 2a over vx. So, let's think about what we just learned, and use it on our equation for the force. Let's just worry about the force exerted by one molecule, which I'll call F1. In the numerator, we've got the change in momentum, but we saw a few minutes ago that that's equal to 2mvx. Meanwhile, in the denominator, we've got change in time, and we just saw that that's equal to 2a over vx. Now we can simplify this expression a little. The 2's cancel out, and the vx down here can be moved to the numerator, which gives us the result of m times vx squared divided by a, the length of the box. So that's the force exerted by one molecule on the back wall of the container. Now, what does that tell us about the pressure? Well, you might remember that the pressure is equal to the force divided by the surface area. So, the pressure exerted by particle number 1 on the back wall is equal to the force of the particle divided by the area of the wall. We just saw that the force is mvx squared over a. Now, suppose that the dimensions of the box are a in the x direction, which we already knew, and b and c in the other two dimensions. That means the area of this wall is b times c. We can put that in the denominator of our expression for the pressure. 
So now we have an equation that relates the pressure to the mass and velocity of the particles and the dimensions of the box. We can simplify this a bit because the denominator is a times b times c, which is just the volume of the box. So we'll replace it with capital V. So we're making good progress. We almost have an equation that will be very useful for understanding the motion of these molecules. But, of course, we're not really interested in the pressure exerted by just one particle. Instead, we want to know the overall pressure. To get that, we'll need to add mvx squared over volume for all the particles in the box. The easiest way to write that is with a summation sign. If there are n particles, we can just add mvx squared over volume for each particle. If there's only one gas in the box, then all the molecules will have the same mass, so we can pull the mass out of the summation sign. The same is true for the volume. It's a constant, so it can come out of the summation sign. Unfortunately, we can't do that with the velocity. Each molecule might have a different velocity along the x-axis, so we'll just have to add those together. At first, that sounds like a big problem. The gas might contain something like Avogadro's number of particles. How could we ever hope to measure all their velocities and then square and add them? That would be an almost impossible job. But fortunately, we don't have to do it that way. Instead, think about what we would need to do if we just wanted to know the average of vx squared. When you want to take the average of something, you add the values of each item, then divide by the number of items. So the average of vx squared would be the sum of vx squared for each particle, divided by n, the total number of particles. We use angle brackets to indicate the average value of a property, so this is the symbol for the average of vx squared. If we rearrange this equation to solve for the sum, we get this. Now we can substitute this into our equation for the pressure, which gives us this expression. This is a much better equation than the one we had. Now, instead of adding together the square velocity of each particle, we can just take an average, which is much easier. But we're still not quite done. The equation has the average velocity in the x direction, but we're not really interested in that. We can really only measure the overall velocity, not the velocity along only the x, y, or z directions. It would be nice if we could use the overall velocity instead, which is v squared. It turns out that v squared is just a vector sum of the velocities along the x, y, and z directions. In other words, v squared is just equal to vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared. But wait, the particles should be moving just as quickly in the x direction as they move in the y or z directions. In other words, vx, vy, and vz should all be equal. So v squared should just be equal to 3 times vx squared. If we solve that equation for vx squared, we get this. And now, when we substitute that into our equation for pressure, we get this. This is an even better equation than the ones we've had before. It doesn't force us to add the velocity of every single particle, and it also doesn't focus only on the velocity along one dimension. Instead, it contains the average overall velocity, which is much more reasonable. Unfortunately, not everything in this equation would be easy to measure. We can measure the pressure, the volume, and the mass of the particles, but n, the number of particles, is difficult to measure because they're so small. And v squared is hard to measure too. How can we change this equation to make it easier to use in an experiment? The secret is to remember an equation you probably learned very early in your physics course, the equation for kinetic energy. Here it is. K equals 1 half times the mass times the velocity squared. Now, that's really just the kinetic energy for one particle. If we have millions of particles, we have to use the average of the squared velocity and multiply it by the number of particles, n. But let's stop for a minute and look at these two equations. 
we have one for the pressure and one for the kinetic energy. You might notice that they have some things in common. The most important similarity is that they both have n times m times the average of v squared on the right side. Let's move everything else to the left side of each equation. That leaves us with 3 times pv on the left for the first equation, and 2 times k on the left for the second one. Since the right side of each equation is the same, we can set them equal to each other, which tells us that 2k equals 3pv. Notice what we just did there. We got rid of both the velocity and n, the number of particles, both of which would have been very hard to measure. Instead, now, we just have p, v, and k. p and v are really easy to measure. k, the kinetic energy, is much harder, but we can rearrange the equation to solve for k. So, we have an equation for the kinetic energy of a gas that's pretty easy to use. And if we're dealing with an ideal gas, we can make it even simpler. We can use the ideal gas law to replace PV with nRT. That gives us an incredibly simple equation. It tells us that if we have n moles of gas, that the kinetic energy just depends on the temperature, which is very easy to measure. So, for example, suppose we have a 0 0.650 mole sample of the gas Krypton at 300 Kelvin. What would be its kinetic energy if it behaves like an ideal gas? We'll use this equation. All we need to do is use 0 0.650 moles for n and 300 Kelvin for T. You might remember that there are two values for the constant R depending on the units we use. R is equal to 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per kelvins moles, or 8.314 joules per kelvin mole. Which one should we use? Well, we want to calculate energy, which usually has units of joules, so we'll use 8.314. That gives us a result of 2,430 joules, so that's the kinetic energy you might have noticed that there was something a little strange about this calculation. We had the gas Krypton, but we never used that information. We would have gotten the exact same result if we had had 0 0.650 moles of helium, or hydrogen, or any other gas. That doesn't sound very realistic, and in fact, this equation really only works for ideal gases. It does work pretty well for the inert gases in the last column of the periodic table, though, because those are the most like ideal gases. So, we now have a good equation for the kinetic energy of an ideal gas, which we got by starting with very fundamental definitions of the meaning of pressure. But one thing we said we were interested in doing was finding the velocity of the gas particles and the velocity dropped out of our equations a while back before we got a good equation for it. Let's go back to one of our earlier equations to add velocity in it and see if we can get a good, easy-to-use expression that'll tell us the velocity of our gas molecules. Here's the first equation we had for the kinetic energy. Aside from the velocity, it also has m in it, which is the mass of one molecule. It's not very easy to measure the mass of one molecule, but it is easy to look up the molecular mass on the periodic table. The molecular mass is given this symbol, a script m, and it's just equal to the mass of one molecule times Avogadro's number, which has the symbol Na. If we solve this equation for the mass of a molecule, we get this. We can substitute that into our expression for the kinetic energy, which gives us k equals n times one-half m over na times the average square velocity. We can simplify this a little because n, the number of particles, divided by Avogadro's number, is equal to the moles. That gives us this equation. So, the kinetic energy is equal to one-half n times m times the average square velocity. And as we saw earlier, the kinetic energy is also equal to 3 halves nRT. We can set these two equations equal to each other, which gives us this.
This is a pretty significant result. Everything in this equation is easy to measure except for v squared. That means if we solve the equation for v squared, we'll have a way to really easily calculate the velocity of the molecules in a gas. When we solve for the average v squared, here's what we get. The 2 and the n will both cancel out, which finally gives us this equation. The average v squared is just equal to 3rt over m, the molecular mass. As you can tell, this gives us a squared velocity. We're usually more interested in just a velocity, so we usually take the square root of this property. The result is called the root mean squared velocity, or RMS velocity. Let's try using this equation. Suppose we have a sample of hydrogen gas at 300 Kelvin. What will be the RMS velocity? To find out, we'll use this equation. R is 8.314 joules per kelvin's moles, and the temperature is 300 K. What about the molecular mass? Remember, hydrogen gas is H2, not just H. So using the periodic table, we find that H2 weighs 2.01568 grams per mole. But wait, let's think about our units here for a moment. The units for R include joules. You might remember that joules are equal to kilograms times meter squared over second squared. Notice that the unit contains kilograms, not grams. So in order for our units to cancel out correctly, our mass should be in kilograms. So for the molecular mass, we have 0.00201568 kilograms per mole. That makes the term under the square root equal to 3.7122 times 10 to the 6th. As far as the units, the kelvins cancel out, and so do the kilograms and the moles. That leaves us with meter squared over second squared. Now we'll take the square root, which gives us 1,927 meters per second. That's really fast, almost 2 kilometers per second. That reminds us that the molecules in a gas are moving very rapidly. Let's try one last problem. Suppose we boil water. What's the RMS velocity of a water molecule at the boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius? We'll use this equation again. The temperature is 100 Celsius. But remember, we need it to be in Kelvin, so we'll use 373.15 Kelvin. Meanwhile, the periodic table tells us that water has a molecular mass of 18.01508 grams per mole, which is 0 0.01801508 kilograms per mole. When we perform this calculation, we find out that the RMS velocity is 719 meters per second. Again, that's really fast. 719 meters per second is about 1608 miles per hour. A water molecule going at that speed could circle the Earth in about 15 and a half hours as long as it didn't hit any other molecules. Of course, our water molecule would hit other molecules before it got very far. That's a fact that we'll be talking about a lot more later in the chapter, because collisions between molecules are responsible for almost all chemical reactions. But that's enough new material for now. We'll talk more about the ways that gas molecules move in the next video, and I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, have a good week.